every Sorry. <laughs> Bill would like that. <laughs> um, it, it took two years to edit. And I edited it very, very slowly. I got a lot of my footage from CBS News. And Bill Plant was actually at many of those events, those historic events. He had a funny story about not getting the footage of C.T. Vivian, Vivian the day he was beaten up because his cameraman wanted a piece of pie after lunch uh -uh. and they were delayed getting back. And I said, well, where do I get the footage? He said, well, we had to buy it from BBC and you can do the same. <laughs> so uh, I, ju I just have to say before, before we break that um, it's one hour, you know, it's one hour, 10 years of history and all that history is vividly in the news archives, right? And then you have somebody like John Lewis will bring his friends together, recall the stories, bring them vividly to life, and voila, we have the pictures that are also there. So it just, it was, it was, it was such a joy to make the film and to make it with Bill. Has the film been Thank you. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, we are going to get something. Please bring the food back into the room um, because we want to get going with the main part of our program. The film was fabulous, but we've got Robin here. And that's even better. So let's grab something to eat and come back, please. And for those of you online, please be patient with us. We'll be right back. Do you want me to talk? Okay, I think we're ready to restart our conversations. Robin, I'm sorry. I know you're still chewing. I'm still working on my getting the food off my teeth. <laughs> All right. So thank you, thank you for staying for the uh, the curtain talk <laughs> afterwards. Um, I did share with you uh, the stories about the making of the film and the making of the film, obviously from the filmmaker's point of view is a, such a huge part of it. But there's also the film. Robin, can you stop? And I'm backing up and I'm just gonna stand right here. Perfect. I'm standing on my X. That doesn't sound quite right, but it's that standing on the spot. So what I would love to do is, is open it up to you uh, for comments, because a lot of people like to make comments uh, based on their experience with John, uh, with, the, with the movement, um, with voting rights, with any parts of it. So I'm going to open it up to that. But also, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about the making of the film or even the use of the film, ask away. Yes. What would John Lewis tell us today to do? He said at the end that we were becoming silent. And it seems that we're giving away our rights with both hands and sitting silently while that's happening. What would John tell us to do? What kind of courage and sacrifice would he encourage us to show in a time as fraught as you showed in that documentary? Well, he actually, before he passed away, uh, was quite vocal about uh, what engagement needed to look like today. It was very interesting trying to end the film because I knew that the film had to end with Selma, but then it was, but what's the message? There's still so much to do, you know, there, there are just so many different ways to go with the message. And so that which John said, which is, People say to me, nothing's changed. I say, come walk in my shoes. But he also would say, and there's so much to be done. 
you have to stay engaged. He wrote, uh, I think his book was called Good Trouble, or the film about him was called Good Trouble. And he spoke often about that during his life. You know, as a, as a young man um, experiencing discrimination and his parents telling him not to get in trouble, you know, to stay out of the way. And he found a way to get in trouble, which he called good trouble. And he, he kept that message going through, through the end of his life. I mean, this film was completed in 2007, oh. right? 2007. Um, and he had a lot more time after that to continue to work on many, many issues. But his voice continued to be a real strong catalyst for so many people to actually know that they as individuals could do something and should do something. Yes. I wasn't quite sure how he came to prominence and the, the, the attention of Martin Luther King. Was it because of the lunch counter sins? It was before the lunch. The, the question is, how did he come to prominence? Uh, he he was um, intrigued by Martin Luther King, and he sent a letter and said, you know, I'm a young man. Uh, he was in his teens. I live in Troy. Um, I'm going to be going. He was going to seminary. I mean, he was he was going to be entering faith. Um, but and he it went to university at Nashville, and he knew he wanted to be involved. So he wrote to Martin Luther King and asked, you know, if, if he could meet him. And when they met, right, and he was all nervous as, as a young man, and he came into his presence. Martin Luther King said to him, are you the boy from Troy? So he remembered the letter. I mean, think about that. I mean, how many, how many letters do we think he got? He remembered the letter, and, and it, as John tells us himself, you know, knowing him, sitting next to him, being part of the movement, changed his life forever, right? I also want to make a few comments just about the humility of John Lewis. And humility, I think, was in our homily today. <laughs> The, the one that was online. I'm looking. I'm looking at the pastor from Holy Trinity who is here. John Lewis was the real deal. Truly, truly humble. And when I was making, when I was editing the film, and it, it did take a long time, he didn't ask to see anything. He saw it for the first time when we showed it at the Motion Picture Association, right? And it was making its debut. That's the first time we saw the film. And after the film, he pulled me up in front of everybody and we're standing there in front of the, of the audience and he's holding my hands like this. And I, I felt like we were being married. And it was just like, oh my God. And he just talked to me about how important it was that the story be told, that it was told well, and that he was very pleased, right, that uh, it was, it was going to happen. Now, there was another politician who was very, very involved in the making of a film, Al Gore, and he did a film on climate change. And that film actually got an Academy Award nomination. And I thought to myself, you know, John, if you were not as humble as you are, perhaps we could have an Academy Award nomination for this film. But I mean, you really, what, what a joy to know him and to be inspired by him. It's more of a comment, Robin. Um, I liked hearing someone voice that the civil rights movement was not all about Dr. King. I think that's something that we've kind of lost touch with, and I don't know how we can help our historians and the people who teach our young people to understand it was such a organic 
splintered sounds negative. I don't mean it in a negative way, but mm -hmm. in so many different places and so many different viewers. And honestly, I'll just talk about women for a moment. There are a lot of women who are super involved in the background of this. Um, I think that's an important story to tell. And I, I think you did that with Fred Shuttlesworth. You brought him in, which was a different voice, which was good. We don't, a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Reverend Shuttlesworth. And, and Reverend Shuttlesworth was a huge deal in Birmingham. Controversial, but very, very well. A lot of us are controversial, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's that, that's going to come with the territory. But yeah, he was legendary in Birmingham. And you know, you probably noticed he said it was seven years before I invited yeah. Martin Luther King to come to Birmingham. You know, so Birmingham was his city, right? It was his, his place. Yeah, and of course, there was a lot of that within the movement. Robin, you included so many powerful images, both photographs, video, a lot was familiar, the fact that you were able to bring it all together in such a powerful way, um, I thought was masterful. One of the elements that was um, unclear to me or, or, or educational for me was the training that the demonstrators got and how to behave nonviolently and that that preparation gave them the courage the peace of mind to submit to the violence that was uh, that came upon them. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, and that that work um, was Reverend Lawson's work, right? I mean, he, he was the, the great organizer. But I'm standing here as a filmmaker, standing on the shoulders of other documentary filmmakers. The reason I have that footage is there was a terrific crew that did a film about Lawson, about the organization, about the students in Nashville. That's when that 19-year-old John Lewis was interviewed. It was from that film, that little stagey thing with the um, the waitress and the, and the little pan up her and, and her answer. That was created by that documentary team that was doing it. Um, so I was blessed to know that I could have access to that footage, right? And thank you for noting um, the collage, the montage, the collection, because this, this as a filmmaker is so important to me that we have news organizations that were out there getting the images, getting the, the television footage, but there also were photojournalists who had gotten money from a lot of Jewish foundations who were sent to the South to do this documenting and to have access to their images, right? Which are just so incredibly powerful because they were, they were in there doing the work of photojournalists. And then also the music and to have both Dorothy Cotton and Betty, you know, who are just incredible um, and were very, very involved in the music of the time, but they're also involved in music education. Dorothy's no longer with us. I'm, I'm not even sure about Betty. I haven't checked in on her in a long time, but that, that comment that we could tell the whole story of this nonviolent struggle through the music, I think is such a powerful statement to make. And then for the music to be a voice in that film on that same level with John and Dorothy and Bob Zellner and the music and, and the words of those songs were a very important part of the narrative. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Rob, thank you very much for doing this. It's fascinating. But um, I, like you, probably everybody else in the world, was thrilled to hear Bill's voice at the yeah. end of the movie. Uh, and if you talk a little bit about what his role was during this period, was he covering the civil rights movement, or where was he during some of these big events? Yeah, the, the civil rights movement was a very big part of Bill Plant's early career. And he, he said, and he said this publicly to many people that when he was sent from Chicago 
down to Mississippi. And one of his first stories was uh, looking for the, the young activists who went missing, who were found in the river. Uh, that was one of his first stories to cover. He, he talked about it being like the dark side of the moon, the, the experience of being down there. Now, Bill is uh, very, very proud of his Jesuit education, prep school and university. And the social justice components of that are a big part of his education. So he was aware of things, right, at a, on an intellectual level, but then to actually experience it was eye-opening for him. So Bill was down there from 1964 um, all the way through. He was covering the voter registration in Selma. You know, so he was there, you know, for a lot of the stuff that you saw on the screen, except he was in Chicago the day of Bloody Sunday. So he wasn't there for that. And I did tell the story of how his crew missed the CT Vivian. But, but, but we got to that. So yeah, the, this was a very big part of his development as a, as a young correspondent at CBS News. And what was so magical for me is that, you know, he went on the pilgrimage several times, you know, and he spoke you know, at, on the pilgrimage, but that he would, uh, bring that first person experience to me, you know, to my to my editing, to my questions as I was just trying to figure out what to keep in, what to not go with, you know, those kinds of things. And so it was a it was a really rich, and I'll use the word again, magical part of editing this to have built plan right there. And some of us were lucky enough, to, um, another gift Bill gave us was on the 50th anniversary year, he did a presentation for Georgetown Village on 50 years after Selma. And it was pre-COVID and pre-Zoom, so we didn't record it. Mm -hmm. However, it was a phenomenal presentation. Yeah, I remember that one. I saw a hand over there, yeah. Um, I didn't grow up here. I, I grew up in the UK during this period and obviously saw some coverage. Um, but how important was the coverage um, for these events by people like Bill Clark and CBS obviously in terms of um, getting the policy changes that and the support to make the changes that were so badly needed? I, I think um, the newspaper reporter, Jack Nelson, who was in the film actually speaks to this, that it was an important story to cover. What was happening in front of the cameras was known within the Black community because the Black newspapers and periodicals were reporting on it. It, it was not a secret, right? But it wasn't making it into mainstream media. And it was the fact that the uh, the networks, the three major networks at the time went down there. The fact that the photojournalists were actually commissioned, given money to be able to go there and to tell the stories and to bring the pictures out so that the pictures could then be experienced by a wider audience. It was a very, very important part of the movement. Very important. And it was intentional. You know, it, um, there was a lot of work on behalf of the organizers to make sure that there were events or um, things that were happening, like the sit-ins, right, that could be filmed and that would make for good television. Yes. Robin, we're, uh, you refer to the... Uh three uh, sewer rights workers that disappeared the most on Shirty Goodman. Yes, yeah. And it has been, and in any, uh, yeah. has there ever been a documentary done on that? I know there's a book, Three Lives from Mississippi, which is wonderful, but has there ever been a documentary done on that? 
I'm pretty sure there has been. I, I can't tell you the name of it, but I, I'm pretty sure there has been. It's such an important story. Mississippi burning uh, was another um, big part of that and the, and the story. But young Bill Plant was there. <laughs> Uh, when you were developing the idea of this uh, documentary, did you have any particular audience in mind as to who you distributed to and where did that end up? So I'm so happy that um, so, my, my fellow board member has left the room <laughs> because I'm, I'm one. Oh. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> and so the question just left my mind. So tell me again the question. <laughs> oh, audience. Yeah. Did I have where would you yeah. envision? Yeah. So my confession to you is I'm not a filmmaker that has her impact producing plan in place when she's actually making the film. I've come to be that filmmaker, but I wasn't at this time. This film and the idea for it was not something that I saw independently. It was delivered into my lap by an opportunity. And I, I talked a little bit about that before. So I was literally following the quest to tell a story. When the film was first done, we actually had a wonderful distribution with PBS. And we uh, had a, a relationship with a, an organization called Facing History. Facing what? Facing History. And they created curricula, um, you know, that was uh, available. And so when it was on PBS and it was being made available to teachers, there were resources that had been developed. But all of that kind of I mean, I, I heard Bill say you could go to my website and you could get these things. And unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> but, you know, during the four years that we had the PBS broadcast, it was very, very true. And it's one of my regrets that I haven't really um, packaged it with that kind of curricula. Having said that out loud, it has occurred to me that it's not too late <laughs> that this film has a real resonance yes, as it's timely and a lot of those things that I started developing could be further developed and should be further developed and the whole distribution ability has changed so much from you know 2007 to begged PBS to put your film on the air you actually paid PBS to put your film on the air, because that was the way you were going to reach your audience. You speak of the, the black press. Since small newspapers have been investigated, are black newspapers still a force in America today? That's a question I can't answer because I, I don't know, but all small papers. Exactly. You know, and this is an incredible loss. And I have to tell you, it's actually an issue that was very important to Bill Plant. And he has a, a, a chair at Loyola University. And one of the things that they're very interested in doing is, is shoring up local reporting and the distribution of local news. Hey, I just add something. I, I did my master's thesis on the black press. Good. And so it was much, much wider. Every city had a black newspaper, but don't forget, cities had multiple newspapers, the morning and afternoon papers. Just like best analogy, if I may say, about black businesses on U Street that closed when department stores downtown stopped being segregated, that people could go to the other stores. What <laughs> example that comes to mind about this? What we're doing here now is the issue of lynching and anti-lynching campaigns, which went on for decades when lynching was happening. And for instance, FDR wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. The people went to him, just like he wouldn't touch for a long time what was happening with uh, 
the Holocaust. And there were just issues that, for whatever reason, we were touching. The black press was keeping it out there and was re actively reporting on it, even though it was very, very difficult because they couldn't send reporters, black reporters, to other people to these things happening. The other side of it was William Randolph Hearst's papers would never report on it. Their editors were told if you do report on it, you're going to lose your job. And they actively reported falsely that the that lynching was happening. So papers were trying to, and not just one, not like one or two years, but decades, saying this is going on, this is going on, it's happening all over every county in some states, it's happening in, in the hundreds per year in some states. And yet maybe the papers, barely, the New York Times would barely touch it, and the Hearst papers were prohibited from printing it. And in fact, would have editorials, and they would print false articles saying that this was not happening. That this was fake news started by radical leftists, black papers, they, they accused the black papers of being, of being influenced by Jewish influences, whatever that means, by communist influences. They did everything they could to go against it, when in reality, it was an out and open part of white supremacy in many, many, many states and part of our country for decades. Um, it's, I can't help but think about the analogy of things that are going on today, where one big media empire is able to push a certain false narrative like birtherism or Saddam and 9-11 to such a degree that the American public to a whole is bamboozled because they don't want to believe anymore. Where Where is your master thesis now? <laughs> Well, it's on a shelf somewhere. My mother has copies. <laughs> um, There's a beautiful museum that opened recently in Montgomery. I unfortunately call it the Lynching Museum. That is not the name of the museum. That's what I call it too. <laughs> it's not a good name for it. It has a beautiful name. Um, they, but they have a copy of it. I, I, they have a copy. I, yes. Yeah. I was very honored when they yeah. said they would put it in their collection, but it's. It's a very powerful. I've written books on it and stuff. Yeah. It's a powerful, powerful exhibit. Yes. yes. How are we doing? Uh, Robin, that you said this film was 2007. Have you given any thought since then to what you would do to make a sequel to it to bring us more up to current time? Or have your intentions and interests been other places? Uh, my attentions have been other places. But as I, I mentioned earlier, just a, a little while ago, is I do think, oh, good, Rayanne is back. She's from my board of directors. <laughs> I, I do think that, that there would be value in packaging this film, not remaking it, packaging this film with contemporary materials. There was another organization that picked it up called Just Faith. I don't know who's, if anybody in the room is familiar with them, but it's just a wonderful um, church-based organization that creates curriculum and, and makes it available to parishes and, and churches. And they used Come Walk in My Shoes for a number of years and had, you know, curricula around it. What an early distribution target? Governor Nikki Haley. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. Do we have questions from the? We do. Not, I do not see any questions from online. If you have any, please put it into the chat or unmute. No. Okay. Um, chat. I guess that's you. Well, no, that was the chat us telling them they could put in questions <laughs> earlier. Yeah, yeah. So we're probably we are probably. Um, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being engaged. Thank you for allowing us to keep the Bill Plant legacy alive through the Bill Plant conversations. And thank you, Robin. I mean, it is an honor to keep Bill's legacy going in this way. And we at Georgetown Village appreciate your trusting us with this legacy. So thank you very much for a phenomenal program, really absolutely amazing. 
Um, I also wanted to um, state just a couple of things. We have copies of our 2023 impact report. If you have not seen it yet, please take a look at it. We're pretty proud of what we've done and we'd love to share. Um, we also have, for those of you who are not members, a questionnaire about how you heard about the program and a request for contact information so that we can share more of these programs with you. In addition, if you are a member and you have not filled out our membership survey yet, we have copies of that as well. So, um, and I wanted to mention as a follow-up to this program, we have two books. Uh, we do have the Good Trouble book, John Lewis's book, and we also have another book about John Lewis that we purchased for the Village Square for our members who would like to read them. So we do have extra resources available. Uh, there are some cookies left. Please help yourself on the way out. And thank you for coming this evening. And thank you for those of you joining us online. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, don't forget those. <laughs> oh, I have a suggestion.